Hello everyone, welcome to this week's EKG. The case we have for you this week I think is really interesting. Here's the first look at our 12 lead. I'll let you take a look at that for a second, see what you think, and then we'll go through some subtle findings in there that I think are important. The case starts with an 81-year-old male who has a history of diabetes and the call actually went out as an allergic reaction call which made me kind of smile. But you get there and you find out that he's actually complaining of weakness on one side of his body and has slurred speech. Immediately you're concerned for stroke. You see that he's got slurred speech. In fact, um, he does have some facial droop. His arm is drifting. He's Cincinnati positive with a lambs of four. You get your vital signs. You see that his heart rate is 72. His blood pressure looks okay. His oxygen level is also okay. Very importantly, you get a blood sugar. Anytime you have a stroke patient, 162. That also checks out. So now we're very concerned about stroke. Just a quick reminder, if you've got someone where you're have a high degree of suspicion for stroke, the three things you absolutely want to get on every stroke patient. We already have our blood sugar, but you also want to obtain a last known normal status. When was the last time they were at their neurological baseline? That'll help the timing at the hospital and is a very important number to get. And then the family phone number, so someone who can help collaborate the history at the hospital. In addition to those three things, of course you're going to get an EKG. The reason we get EKG in stroke patients, we're looking for a possible atrial fibrillation or maybe some sort of rhythm that is not really conducive to perfusing the brain. So EKGs are also very important in strokes. This is what we get, so let's go through this together. Our rate, um, as always, we look up here at the number, 68 is what the computer's telling me. I'm going to confirm with my eyes. I find a QRS complex that lines up on one of the thick red lines, and then I'm going to count down to the next QRS complex. So 300, 150, 100, 70, 60, between 60 and 70. Um, I agree, it's about 68. I think the computer's right here. We'll go ahead and move on uh, to our rhythm. The neck, there's two things we evaluate when we're trying to think about our rhythm. The first is, is there a P wave before every QRS? So I do in fact see P waves. The best place to see them is in lead two. Um, but I do see these kind of throughout in every, um, every lead for every beat. So they do march out. Um, what I notice here though is that they look a little long. And this, the interval between the P and the QRS complex is your PR interval. That should be less than 0.2. Well here, again, we can use our computer to do the math for us. It's 0.236 or over 200 milliseconds. So another easy way to think about this, if you're not great at numbers and can't remember the greater than 0.2 is greater than five small boxes, which is also equivalent to one big box. So we'll call this a prolonged PR. Um, but we do have P waves before every QRS, so we know this is a sinus rhythm. And the next question is, is this regular? The answer is yes. Um, these march out pretty regularly. I don't see any big gaps between QRSs, any short gaps. Looks very regular, so we'll call this a regular sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block. And that first degree AV block is defined by the long PR interval here. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Our axis, remember we look at lead one and lead AVF. In lead one, we have our left thumb, the QRS is mostly going up. In lead AVF, the QRS is mostly going down. What we're left with here is left axis deviation based on those findings. And then we move on to our intervals. So we always look at our QRS to see if it's wide or narrow. This is less than 120, that's good. Our QTC is here, it's 418, it's less than 450, that's also good. I'll call those intervals normal. And lastly, we get to look at our ST segments. So we read these and I read them from left to right in kind of the territorial distribution. So we look at 2-3 AVF for our inferior leads. Do I see any ST elevation or depression here in my ST segments? I don't. Um, then I move to the high lateral leads, which are 1 and AVL. Again, looking at the ST segments, they appear to be at the baseline. I don't see any concerning changes there. Moving to the septal leads, again, 
uh, I don't see any concerning ST elevation or depression, but something does stick out here. If you'll notice these big deep Q waves here, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, but they're present, can be okay in V1, but they're still present in V1, two, three, and then we also have a little one in V4. So take note of those, we'll talk about those in a minute. If we put this whole EKG together, something that looks pretty benign at the first glance, what we have is a sinus rhythm with a rate of 68, but we have a first degree AV block with Q waves in the septal leads, and we also have left axis deviation, which would suggest a left anterior fascicular block. So there's actually three kind of subtle findings in this one, and I wanted to go through all three of those together with you. First is this uh, long PR interval. This is the distance between the P wave and the QRS, the end of the P wave, the beginning of the QRS. You want this to be less than 0.2, and here we're a little bit longer than that. A little mnemonic I like, if the R is far from P, then you have a first degree. Now a first degree block, um, first degree AV block can be benign. You can see it in young people and it may just mean they have some increased vagal tone. Sometimes in older people you may be a little suspicious. There may be some uh, problems with conduction between the sinoatrial node and the AV node. Just means there's a little pause there. Usually there's nothing to do about this. Doesn't mean they need a pacemaker. Something to take note of, but generally well accepted to be benign and not need much intervention. So, and if you remember, just, just to review the electrical activity, the impulse starts from the sinoatrial node, gets sent to the AV node. Well, this is the distance. Remember, your sinoatrial node is your, makes your P wave, right, when that, when that releases electricity. And then the beginning of the QRS is as the, as the electricity leaves the AV node. And so there's a little pause here between the sinoatrial node and the AV node that's making that PR interval a little bit longer. So that's your first degree AV block. So that's one of the findings on this 12 lead. The next finding on this 12 lead I think is interesting and we'll do a whole section on this um, in the future, but these Q waves here in the septal leads, V1, V2, V3. A normal Q wave is very shallow, it follows the P wave, and it is the beginning of the electricity going through the ventricles as they start to conduct and release all that electricity. What a Q wave is telling you is that there's some dead tissue there. And if you'll look, the computer reads this as an age undetermined anterior septal infarct. And the reason why that is, is because these are technically pathologic Q waves. Q waves that are kind of deep can be normal in leads one. You can see right here, we have a little tiny Q wave in lead AVL. And then also in five and six, we don't really have good Q waves in five and six here, but in one in AVL, you can see them and they can be normal in those leads, just based on the vectors of the electrical conduction through the heart. But if you see them and they look deeper rather than just little tiny divots, these are big Q waves, right? And they kind of catch your eye, um, maybe like daggers or something like that, deeper than two millimeters. And they're more than 25% of the QRS complex. Well, if you look at V2 and V3 here, they're actually the entire QRS complex, right? The majority of that is going down. Um, so we have a check mark here, a check mark here, they're deep. They're the majority of the QRS complex. They are in leads one, two, and three, right? So they're in the concerning spaces. And then they're also in contiguous leads. These are your septal leads. And what that is telling you is that at some point, there is tissue that died. Now the question is, is this acute or is this chronic? Has it been here a long time or is there something going on I need to worry about? They should catch your eye. What it should prompt you to look for is really closely for ST elevation in these leads or in any kind of reciprocal changes in the opposite side. I don't see any of those here, so it makes me believe this is probably an old septal infarct with some tissue that had died from a previous heart attack. Um, so these Q waves can signal you to maybe some previous cardiac disease. And then this gentleman also has a left anterior fascicular block. And we've covered this before really quickly, but just again, one in AVF, he's got left axis deviation here. Um, he also has a big R wave in leads one and AVL. You can see that here and here. 
and then the big S wave, really he's only got the big S wave in lead three. What that's telling us with his left axis deviation is there's some, some delay in the left anterior fascicle that is depolarizing the ventricles and so the majority of the vector is going through the posterior fascicle directing the axis to the left. If you remember our vectors, the majority of that electrical conduction is going to the left. That's why he's got left axis deviation. Um, and we call it potentially a left anterior fascicular block. So this gentleman actually, despite the benign looking 12 lead, has a lot going on. He's got this first degree AV block, he's got this old septal infarct, and he's probably got some diseased left anterior fascicle. None of those I think are contributing to his stroke. They're just good to know and be ready to recognize. And that is it for today. Thank you for your time and attention and I look forward to seeing you next week.